today is going to be Mark Jitt from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's a professor in vaccine epidemiology and with the title of just optimal vaccination strategies. And so if Mark is there, oh yeah, brilliant. It's the screens now sharing. I will pass over to him to kick us off for today. So thank you, Mark. Great, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Ed, and thank you for inviting me to speak. It's fantastic to be here. Um, lots of, um, I can see lots of people on the panelists and the audience whom um, I've, I've, well, some, many of you, I know many of you, your papers I've read, so I'm delighted to be able to interact with you in this session too. And I've also been given a, a very attractively broad title, Optimal Vaccination Strategies, which really um, enables me to speak about um, most things I've been doing in the last year or so, which is fantastic. But it's also so broad that it's, I started off asking, well, what do we actually mean by this title? What am I, what am I going to speak about? And so um, I did the sort of first thing an undergraduate would do if they got um, a, an essay topic, which is put it into Wikipedia and see what you get. And so if you put optimum into Wikipedia, you get, um, you, you, you get redirected to uh, well, to, to a page on mathematical optimization. And you start off by looking at the optimization problem, which is a great place to start, especially at a workshop organized by the, um, well, Newton Gateway for Mathematics. And so I'm wondering um, whether I can frame this talk in terms of the optimization problem. Really, we do have an optimization problem. We have various constraints. The constraints might be, you know, the um, doses of vaccines we have, the ability to um, distribute the vaccines, the amount of money we have to buy the vaccines or, you know, to do other things that might control um, COVID. And we have an objective function. But the first thing is to ask, what is our objective function? What are we trying to optimize in the first place when you talk about optimum vaccine distribution? And so from the sort of discourse that's been going on both amongst maybe the sort of expert and also the general public. Maybe there are a couple of different sort of, sort of um, objective functions that we are trying to, um, <clears throat> that, that we're trying to minimize or maximize. Maybe we're trying to minimize deaths, maybe, or maybe we're trying to maximize health. Maybe we're trying to maximize some sort of measure of economic value, or there's just just this general thing that um, I often get asked when I'm sort of interviewed by the media: When are we going to return to normal? So maybe if we can define this concept of returning to normal, maybe that's what we're trying to achieve as fast as possible through vaccination. So what I'm going to do is to actually talk about all these different objective functions and see what the literature has said about the ability to optimize our use of vaccines to achieve this, both in the UK and around the world. Okay, so let's start with the so, sort of maybe the most common problem that has been addressed um, in the literature at least, which is optimal vaccine strategies to minimize death. So the, um, the optimization problem is we've got a certain supply of vaccines which changes over time maybe, and we want to minimize the number of deaths subject to that supply constraint. And so what does that look like? Well, uh, the great thing is some of my colleagues just um, just published a literature review on this topic on models of COVID-19 um, vaccine prioritization. Um, it just came out in BMC Medicine, but it's already out of date. That's an indication of how quick the literature is moving. So the studies in high income countries were reviewed up to about 3rd of March, and I'm going to talk about quite a lot of them. The low and middle income country studies, um, we sort of repeated the review at the sort of like the, the, the final sort of um, peer round of peer reviews, just because there were so few of them, unfortunately, that it was actually worth digging deeper to make sure we were completely up to date. So those go to the 24th of September. And overall conclusion from this early literature, where the question was really, who do we give the vaccines to first, is the vast majority of studies found that minimize to, if you're trying to minimize deaths, prioritizing vaccination of seniors, older adults is optimal. I think that's not so surprising to maybe a lot of people in this audience. We've heard that message before. It's what we're, roughly what we're doing in the UK. And it's driven by, I, if, um, by this very famous, well, line here, but it's really a curve because the y-axis is a log scale, looking at age versus the risk of dying if you get infected with COVID. And this is a very, 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 very sharply logarithmic scale. I mean, this 
now this was published in 2020. We now have more data points from different countries. It might be different in low and middle income countries. Unfortunately, the overall um, infection fatality rates might be higher. It might be different for different variants. Some of these variants look more severe. It might have because of the introduction of sort of new interventions like antivirals or um, multiple antibodies or so forth. But overall, this um, relationship as you go up in age, the infection fatality rate increases exponentially that that relationship holds. So if you're if you're rough for every sort of um, 10, 10 years of age, um, um, your, your age goes up by your risk of dying if you get COVID roughly goes up by an order of magnitude. That's a very, very sharp decrease. And I think that it has been what's driven the vast majority of literature saying prioritizing vaccination of seniors is optimal. But the question is, why is it just most studies and not all studies? And there are a couple of studies that um, look at uh, sort of cases where this might not be the case. And I'm going to look at a few examples just to see these situations. You might or may not think these are situations that happen in practice, but I think it's informative just to look at them. One is a paper by um, Dr. Laura Matrai who I think is actually speaking later, which is fantastic. So I won't go into this so much, except to um, talk about her main conclusion, which was, well, minimizing deaths vaccinate older adults first, unless you're in a situation with very high vaccine effectiveness and coverage. And basically that's saying, if you can reach herd protection very quickly, then sometimes it's better to vaccinate the high transmitters instead. And actually the rest of the literature talks about different cases where um, you're also trying to get to this point instead. Um, so here's some work by um, Peter Jensen and, and Chris Bauch in Canada, uh, looking at Ontario and saying, actually, if your vaccine is only available later on, then actually, <coughs> a strategy to interrupt transmission might actually avert more deaths than an age-based strategy simply because you've built up so much herd immunity already that actually you can just knock, well, herd protection really, that you can knock the sort of um, proportion of um, people who are immune over the herd immunity threshold if you can vaccinate enough, tra enough transmitters and actually stop transmission in the population. And then a third um, example I'd like to point out is some, some work by um, Nantasit Longa Sanatip and colleagues at, um, at, at, at Mahido uh, Moru in, in Thailand, really looking at, uh, conversely, a low incidence setting where there hasn't been much infection. Well, this is Thailand in 2020, I must say, unfortunately, with the arrival of the Delta variant, um, many low incidence settings are starting to struggle with um, uh, COVID outbreaks as well. But at, at this time, really saying if incidence is low, actually conversely you also might find it better to vaccinate low transmit sorry sorry high transmitters because you can get so many vaccines in the population before you see many cases that actually you you can you can you can really flatten the curve significantly before um you 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 start to get many of these cases so these are sort of special sort of settings or special um cases where it might actually be better to vaccinate high transmitters Unfortunately, um, well, fortunately or unfortunately, the two things that might even further change the calculus in favor of vaccinating high, um, high sort of like the, 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 the groups with the highest risk of um, dying rather than the highest transmitters, which who are often not the same groups. One is simply now we've had experience with the vaccines. We find, for instance, here's, um, here's data from the UK, which this is a graph I actually love to show. Uh, because it illustrates certain points really nicely. First of all, this is such a classic example of how vaccines save lives. I think these, this, this graph and these kinds of graphs, I think in the decades to come, are going to replace the graphs of measles that we're so familiar with, where you see measles coverage going up and measles incidents plunging down. I mean, here we have the same thing, but happening on an even faster scale than the introduction of measles vaccination um, more than 50 years ago in the, in, in the UK, um, where you, know, you have vaccination going up and, and in, in the red curve below, we have deaths plummeting um, as, as a result, even though 
though the number of cases continues to be high. But that's the second thing, that these vaccines aren't that great, especially with the new variants, at pre pre preventing transmission, preventing mild, milder cases of COVID. But they are very good at preventing severe disease. And with the arrival at Omicron, that might even be further under the line. I think even two doses of these vaccines might be able to protect against um, severe disease due to Omicron. But without a booster, it doesn't look like um, the existing vaccines have much effect against um, transmission or mild disease. So, so there's also been a divergence between uh, mild disease, which I'm going to talk about later, is a slight misnomer since mild is not quite just a sort of like um, a, 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 a sort of um, tickling cough or something like that. It can be quite nasty, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't result in death. So people survive, people recover from, 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 from mild illness. And so there has been this divergence because the vaccines work so well against severe disease, but less well against mild disease. And I think that has further weighted the scales in favor of prioritizing the sort of um, most vulnerable groups. And I think, um, I mean, this was the live question about a year ago when the vaccines were first rolled out, but I think it's become another live question now in countries like the UK when we're thinking about boosters and maybe reformulated doses in the future. And unfortunately, still a very live question in many parts of the world where vaccine coverage is still extremely low. So in one year, many, like uh, most countries in Africa have uh, unfortunately not been able, have been able to vaccinate a lower percentage of the population than what we reached in the UK within a few months, which um, is an indication of what's, of what's the world's community um, has prioritized. That leads on to my second um, sort of point. Well, op when we talk about optimal, who are we talking about? Which is the population? What are what what really is the scope of that objective function? Is it the UK? Is it our own country, or is it the whole world? And this is nice work by um, Alex Hogan and colleagues, um, which maybe I won't talk so much about because I see she is also going to speak about this. And I'm really glad there's a whole session on actually global allocation of vaccines because I think that is um, the big question um, in 2022 and the emergence of. Omicron has just underlined the importance of that, but really making the point that, well, <clears throat> I, um, allocating vaccines either by the overall population or by the over 65 um, population yeah. will prevent over twice as many deaths as the current way we're allocating, which is prioritizing high income countries. It might not be a conscious decision that the world came together and said, we're going to allocate all the doses to high income countries, but in practice, that's how the current system, which um, is, is based on ability to pre-order doses um, because some countries have more money than others, has, has, has led to. I think I talked a bit about Omicron already, but I think I want to add this in lastly, because I think this also brings back the relevance of asking who should we prioritize, but also even more starkly highlights the importance of global allocation of COVID vaccines. And so here's some work from um, Dr. Um, Rosanna Barnard and other colleagues at, uh, of mine at the London School, really um, looking at the coming Omicron wave um, in, in England and asking, well, under what situations will we get different levels of um, hospital admissions and deaths, and really making the point that the one event that will make the most difference is the rollout of the booster. Although even with the boosters, we could get fairly high incidence, um, especially in the more pessimistic scenarios about immune escape. Uh, but this also poses the problem. I mean, clearly, um, from the UK's perspective, the priority now is roll out the booster as fast as possible to as many people as possible. That's what's going to dampen the wave. What about countries for whom they haven't even rolled out the primary series and let alone the booster. How do we solve this problem from a global point of view? Because we've, if, if there's anything we've learned, it's not enough to say, well, now we've vaccinated our population. We've managed to prevent most deaths in the UK when actually there are large populations that haven't a population level compromise, HIV and so forth, that um, really are, are, are great places for um, variants to emerge and then don't have um, the ac ac access to the, uh, the sort of levels of vaccination that might um, help to reduce trans transmission. So how, how are we going to solve this problem in 2022? Not just the UK problem, but actually the global 
question we have, how do we reduce transmission across the world using the existing tools? So when we're talking about deaths, really, I think these are the, well, first of all, the very clear messages we're getting prioritize the most vulnerable in terms of risk of death or severe disease, but also the wider questions, how do we achieve vaccine equity if we want to um, see, see the end game of this globally? So what if we want to look at a broader um, objective function? Should we be actually, I mean, should we be seeking to minimize the number of deaths or should we be trying to maximize health more broadly? <coughs> And this has been the case made by a couple of um, authors, actually, a group of um, a, 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 a group of um, clinicians and researchers in the USA, really making the point that actually pure mortality might not be the best measure to look at. Actually, years of life lost might be actually, from an ethical point of view, um, a, 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 a sort of like a, 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 more, a, a more ethical uh, measure to look at because it looks at the shortfall in life expectancy that um, COVID is causing rather than, the, uh, rather than just purely the, the number of deaths, um, since unfortunately deaths happen to everyone at some point of their life. We're really talking about death postponement rather than death aversion with any healthcare intervention and and saying this sort of like we in the sort of asset and because I know people dying of COVID have caused tremendous uh, you know tragedy to family members um our friends communities um whatever whatever their age their their, their situation is um but really saying as a community as a society you know we we have limited resources what should we be trying to um, optimize and one one making the point that perhaps it should be years of life lost. But then also some colleagues of mine at the London School saying that actually focusing only on deaths, whether it's years of life lost or absolute numbers of deaths or even cases, actually hides the severity of illness and the long term severity of illness. We've heard lots about long COVID and there is a high health burden in terms of disability on population then maybe um, using me metrics that actually take into account the disabilities like disability or quality adjusted life years and the cost of that disability is also important to look at. And so there was a nice um, article that came out um, from um, DHSC and ONS just a couple of months ago, really talking about the whole pyramid of the mainly the health effects of COVID and actually saying, if we really want to dig deep, mortality and even morbidity is just at the top of this pyramid. After that, there's the second, well, I wouldn't call it secondary because it, I mean, it can be as important as the sort of direct impact as well, but the indirect impact on healthcare capacity. So if you were um, ICU beds, for instance, um, reduced healthcare seeking because, um, for instance, waiting lists get longer, um, GPs are not able to like um, see so many people and so forth. So the impact of that on healthcare seeking and healthcare related activity, and then the indirect impact on health not related directly to healthcare accessibility, like the impact on mental health because of um, lockdowns, because of the loss, loss of loved ones, the impact on education provision, the impact on uh, 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 availability of carers and caregiving and so forth. So the, the sort of total health burden of COVID is much bigger than just the number of COVID deaths that we've been focusing on, or even um, hospital admissions due to COVID. And so here's some work by my um, colleague, Dr. Yang Liu, really um, across the WHO European region and asking, looking, I think the nice thing about this work is looking at different metrics, um, looking at the metric of deaths to start with, um, number of deaths, also number of cases, but also things like adjusted life expectancy loss. So how much life expectancy do people lose across the population as well as a result of COVID? Quality adjusted life expectancy loss, which takes into account the disability associated with even people who don't die of COVID. And then human capital loss, which is an economic measure saying if someone dies or loses um, health, they um, lose productive input into the economy. And so if we put a value on that, how much, um, how much are we averting by using vaccination? <coughs> and this is really saying, well, um, the same message as has, we had before, if we're trying to minimize deaths, then prioritizing older adults for vaccination is optimal. But then actually, if we're using these other metrics, then maybe 
prioritizing young adults or even prioritizing the whole population at the same time, not worrying too much about exactly which age group is getting the vaccine, just rolling the vaccine as fast as possible could actually be optimal, especially when we get to the situations where, um, for, for, uh, for, for instance, um, uh, we, we, we are able to roll out the, 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 the vaccine very quickly and we have very high vaccine efficacy so we can re reach levels of herd protection, high levels of herd protection quickly. So really the, the metric we're trying to um, optimize matters a lot in this. So I've, I've started hinting at this question on economic value. So maybe that's a third objective function we can look at as well as health. Are there other things that matter? And surely there are because much of the debate around COVID has not I mean, the objective function of the UK government and quite possibly the UK population has not been to minimize deaths or even to maximize health. It has been to try to maximize some combination of, you know, minimizing the health loss, but also um, other things that people value, such as the um, economic growth and the freedom to do things that people enjoy, like visiting their friends and family. So you could say what we're really trying to do is to maximize some measure of welfare. What do I mean by welfare? Well, I could go back um, to another optimization problem where a chap called Adam Smith, who was quite influential in economics, um, mentioned, which, well, he, 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 sort of talked about the economic problem of his, of, of his time, which is really, let's talk about a nation of hunters. Um, and let's say the hunting beaver and deer, maybe um, set aside your sort of, um, sort of um, preferences and misgivings if you have no desire to hunt either beaver or deer or use any of the products of beaver or deer. This, um, and, and just use this as a hypothetical example that Adam Smith brought up, which is to say, well, if it costs twice the labor to kill a beaver that, which it does to kill a deer one beaver should naturally exchange for or for or be worth two deer right that's with how much you should be exchanging on the open market a beaver with a um, with 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 two deer and um, economists would draw a line on a graph and say this is the production possibility frontier and so forth but really making the point that you can find a measure of how much value something has in the population and instead of beaver or deer we could equally say well you can talk about health and um, something like income or economic growth or some 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 something with a, a money we, we can put a monetary value on I mean I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like um, finessing through a whole lot of technical and philosophical um, discussion about well how do we actually put a value on health should it be um, <coughs> apologies for the cough should it be based on individual people's willingness to pay for health or should it be a societal measure <laughs> for instance, um, and, and so forth. But really, in principle, we can say, let's put this measure on the things that people value, whether it's health, whether it's um, in individual freedoms to, for instance, not get vaccinated or go out um, regardless of our infection status, um, um, and, um, vis vis visit mass gatherings, wear a mask or not wear a mask or so forth. Uh, and um, our ability to have a job, earn income, and so forth. Let's put um, a value on this based on these sorts of exchanges. Then how do we maximize this? And there are a couple of um, conclusions people have reached. One very, um, it's very broad piece of analysis, I think making a very strong point is um, some work done last year by the RAND, by RAND Europe, really looking at the macroeconomic impact of vaccine distribution in different parts of the world and having a model which really looks at the sectoral impact of vaccines in different, on different parts of um, the economy and then on different countries and trade between different countries and really making the point that the wide, wider global distribution of vaccines will boost economic growth, not just more having more equitable economic growth, but actually help to boost economic growth even in the countries which um, have a lot of access to vaccines because for global economic recovery to be achieved, actually, we need the, the sort of widest global distribution of vaccines. So that's one sort of perspective, a very macroeconomic perspective. Let's look at the economic growth and, 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 and see how we can best use vaccines. Another perspective we can have is a microeconomic perspective. So let's, let's look at individuals and what happens to them. They, I mean, if they get vaccinated, they might not get COVID. That is of value to them. And then also that's also of, um, of value because it saves money to the healthcare system, not looking at the sort of wider impacts on the economy as well. And this is a 
sort of classic cost effectiveness analysis. And this was done by um, together with colleagues in Pakistan as well, looking at vaccination in Sindh province and looking at a situation where there have been already pretty large epidemics and vaccines as they will be rolled out in um, Pakistan will not be um, rolled out fast enough to avert most of the cases of COVID because they've already happened. But really the point um, that the analysis um, was able to find that at, at, even at, with, with um, so, sort of the, this slow rollout of vaccines, you might say it's too late, even then vaccination is cost effective and may even be cost saving if the efficacy is high and prices are low enough because these vaccines save so many many lives prevent so many um, prevent so much burden on the healthcare that even the sort of residual preventing the deaths at the tail end, even that is cost effective. So um, that I, I think that sort of helps address the argument that maybe it's too late for those countries that haven't vaccinated. Well, it's not too late because as long as epidemics are continuing, these vaccines, if they can be priced at sort of COVAX prices are still extremely cost effective and may even be cost saving. Finally, I'm going to speak briefly just talking about, well, what about this question of returning to normal? Um, so maybe our objective function is some sort of indicator measure to say, have we returned to normal? And so, but what do we mean by returning to normal? And um, I think one question to ask is, can we eliminate COVID? And here's a, um, some work done by um, David Hodgson and some um, other colleagues, really looking at the herd immunity threshold for, for different viruses, including um, SARS coronavirus 2. And this was before the emergence of even, of, of even Delta, let alone Omicron. And really making the point that with the original um, strain of COVID, the, the wild type um, um, original um, COVID strain that emerged in, in early 2020, well, if we could achieve effective vaccine coverage, really, is the Y axis. So if vaccine effectiveness times vaccine coverage of about 80%, that means vaccinating most of the population with a good vaccine we could actually prevent any more COVID transmission. So we could actually re achieve herd immunity. With the, um, with the arrival of the alpha variant of COVID, so that's this point, the R, R naught, the R with, in the absence of any immunity or um, measures, increases to about four to five. And so we're getting very close to this line, which is the, which is the herd immunity threshold. We're getting very close to this line, so it's looking increasingly hard to eliminate um, um, COVID, SARS coronavirus 2 now since, um, well, at that time, the vaccines were only licensed for over 18 years old. Now the licensure indication is increasing, but even so, we're getting very close to this line. We need extremely high coverage to eliminate. And now with the Delta variant, we're more in this territory. So I think the option of even being able to eliminate COVID, even if we achieve percent coverage of the population with currently available vaccines is probably off the table. There's no chance that we will achieve herd immunity through vaccination alone as a result of the increased transmissibility of Delta, unfortunately. And I mean, that also brought up, brings up the intriguing notion that actually, if perhaps globally, we could have got our act together very quickly in, um, in, in the early part of 20, 2020, maybe this might have been possible, or maybe it was never uh, um, an option in, in early 2021, but just, well, lots of what if scenarios. So if that's not possible to eliminate, what are the sort of long-term consequences? And here I'm talking about some work from um, Frank Sandman and um, other colleagues, looking at various um, scenarios of what's, um, what the future might look like. And really, depending on vaccine effectiveness and depending on what uh, sort of physical distancing measures we're willing to consider, if we're not uh, willing to consider any vaccine effective, um, any non-pharmaceutical interventions, then actually what we're really looking at, if we have an incredibly good vaccine, then we're looking at a sort of like a le uh, some level of endemicity. And then if we're not, we're looking at sort of, um, sort of annual out breaks and quite, quite a high level of endemicity. And as we're willing to contemplate more and more strict physical um, distancing measures, the sort of level of endemicity sort of decreases the peaks and troughs decrease. So we get a sort of more steady level of endemicity. Um, I mean, there was, there was some back of envelope calculations I did as well, really um, making the case that, making the point that if we don't have any control measures, um, given the sort of like, um, 
current infection fatality rates and R0 that we expect from Delta, we would probably get a burden of COVID, which is um, several times the burden of flu, um, 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 e even going forward, even after we vaccinated the entire population. So COVID will be more severe than flu if we do nothing. If we have some measures in place, it may perhaps could be brought down to the level of burden of flu, but it is it, it, it might not it might not be a sort of like real disaster it has been in 2020 2021 but it is more it is definitely going to cause a higher burden than flu for at least a sort of like medium term future until there's some long term change in um, uh, the, the host immunity and I I think I'm slightly running out of time. So I'm going to skip the next two slides, partly because I, um, the last slide is some really nice work by Dr. Caroline Wagner and colleagues. But I think she's here and going to sp probably speak about this already. So um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to her. I, I think the work she, she's been doing, her and her group has been doing is fantastic. I'm just going to sum up some key messages from this. Um, just a summary of different insights we get from the literature. First of all, uh, straightforward, if we're minimizing deaths, then usually prioritizing the most vulnerable, older adults is the best strategy, unless we can achieve herd immunity very quickly, which is starting to look like it's off the table. However, we're trying to maximize other health measures, which actually there might be quite a good ethical and practical case for doing so, then we might want to prioritize other groups first. It depends on the rollout speed, it depends on how much herd protection there already is from prior immunity. And many of these health and non-health benefits of vaccines actually lie beyond prevention of deaths. <clears throat> Vaccination might be cost effective even if vaccines are too late to prevent most deaths. Really important in settings which have not had access to as many vaccines as we've had in the UK. It is still a good idea to bring vaccines to those places. Herd immunity is looking unlikely and I didn't really have time to talk much about this, but those sharing, making sure we have more equitable distribution of vaccines can both of all had first of all achieve greater good, um, greater global good if we're a sort of altruistic global sort of like um, benevolent decision maker saying how do we want to achieve the greatest goal. But even if we're maximizing our self-interest from a UK perspective could be rational in terms of both um, reducing the emergence of variants and achieving economic recovery that can benefit ourselves. And that's all from me. Thank you very much.